Thank you, and uh, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I have five children of my own, and uh, my children are enrolled in public schools. So this is going to be impacting me as it's going to be impacting you. Uh, we want to start by introducing Janet Barisi. On January 10th, 2011, she was sworn in as Oklahoma's first new state school superintendent in 20 years. She worked in both the Hera and Norman school systems as a speech pathologist and ran a special summer clinic for severely handicapped children with speech and language problems. She joined uh, the OU Health Science Center where she served patients at the Children's and Universities Hospital. In 1984, she became a dentist who was very active in the community. She established Oklahoma's first public charter school, Independence Charter Middle School, and as a result of its success, she started the Harding uh, Charter Preparatory High School. Will you please give a warm welcome to State School Superintendent Janet Barisi. Thank you, Pat. Well, good morning, and I want to first of all express my appreciation for all of you coming out and, as Rhonda said, giving up your Saturday to be here to take part in this discussion, a very important discussion where we're talking about the future of our children, the future of our education system in the state. It is indeed an honor and a privilege, and um, I am very happy to be here, seeing some familiar faces in the crowd, and it's always good to be able to get out and to visit with you as, uh, as well. You're very committed to it. First of all, you paid to get in, and I want you to know how much I really appreciate you coming here and supporting the 912 project. I also appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to speak with people who believe that their world is a bit different than what the Tulsa world would like it to be. A uh, pretty liberal newspaper, and it's one that uh, is, is very good at giving a, a rather distorted view of the world to their public and very liberal approach to, uh, to the news. And so I always appreciate the opportunity to get out here and to visit with real people and to be able to relate to them in that fashion. I want to express appreciation to Rhonda and to the 912 Project for inviting me here today. Um, this is presenting a very important forum, uh, a forum where we have an opportunity to hear all sides of all of the issues as I know they have done with other issues. And um, I think that's important. That's important for all of us to be able to present our positions and to discuss them in an appropriate forum. You know, the Tulsa world has told you that I'm just a dentist. I'm just a dentist that's state superintendent. Well, they are accurate about one thing. I am a dentist. I'm a retired dentist. Um, I retired from dentistry approximately six years ago. But before that, I was an educator. And really, education has never left my heart. Um, I have an education degree and a master's degree in speech and language disorders. And I worked in two school districts as a speech and language pathologist, the Norman and the Harris School District. And as Pat told you, I even led a summer clinic for multiple handicapped children while I was in Hera. It was during that time I really gained a passion, a passion for understanding children that had learning problems because I worked with a lot of kids that had speech and language problems but they also had reading problems and other types of learning problems and I was interested in doing that. While I was in Norman, uh, because of a, I have some expertise in assessments, um, I was also asked to spend extra time on assessing children that had learning problems. Those were in the early days where we were assessing children for special education. Norman had a big backlog of kids that need to be assessed, and so they pulled me off my duty, and I spent time administering tests to those children so they could receive the proper services for their problem. And I became more and more interested in those challenges that met children every day. And I knew those, that wasn't just simple. It wasn't a simple problem at all. 
and I knew it was complex and it required a comprehensive approach to helping those children. And so that hit off my early interest in education and my passion. I then went to dental school and practiced dentistry in Oklahoma City for 23 years. And so I came to, back to education continually. And the reason I came back to it, because I was a mom, a mom in Northwest Oklahoma City, a mom with twin sons that had learning challenges of their own and learning how to read. And I knew that they needed a special approach to their learning. And it was about the time that they were in the fourth grade in a public school in Oklahoma City that my husband and I began to talk about where they would be going to middle school. Because ladies and gentlemen, at that time, the choices in Oklahoma City weren't very good. Uh, there was no discipline within the classrooms. This, the, the curriculum that they were teaching was dumbed down. And it was not the type of environment and the type of learning environment my husband and I wanted for our sons. Now, it's true, we could have written a check and sent them to private schools, but we weren't sure that that was what we wanted either. We wanted our kids to have a public school education. And so, like you, with the 912 Project, I just started a grassroots organization, got together with like-minded parents from really from all over Oklahoma City and the surrounding area. And we began to talk about what we wanted for our children in education. And the one thing I found out is that the other parents that joined in wanted the same thing. They wanted their children to have a rigorous curriculum. They wanted accountability by their education officials. They wanted to be a part of the answer, not feel like they were shut out by the establishment. They wanted to be able to have an integral part in making sure their children were successful. And so we went forward and put a proposal to the Oklahoma City public school system for a school. And very long story short, they said yes. An independence enterprise middle school opened. Two years later, I had the privilege of helping to write and to gain passage of the state's charter school law. And the school converted to being a charter school. It is a school that was governed by the parents of the students that were in the school. And it was a school where they were very involved in the hiring of both the principal and all of the teachers. It was one where the parents decided on the appropriate curriculum for the children and the parents selected something called the core knowledge curriculum. I think you all are familiar with that type of a curriculum. And a very rigorous mathematics curriculum to go along with it. It was one where we believed that we needed to develop the citizenship skills in our students. And so every child was required to be a part of a community project to help them understand their part within the community. It was one that heavily promoted parent participation in the school. As a matter of fact, each parent was asked to devote 50 hours of volunteer work towards the, uh, towards the success of the school. And with that, we built a strong school. A couple years after independence converted to charter status, a very nice English teacher from Putnam City Schools gave me a call one day in my office and told me that she was a high school teacher, a high school AP, advanced placement teacher. And she believed that it was possible for all students to achieve advance in advanced placement courses. That she didn't like the fact that kids were being qualified academically to be in these courses and that she knew that if you raise the bar for every child, that every child would meet that bar with the appropriate guidance. And she knew that kids that were in poverty and kids that were struggling in school could still achieve the, their dreams and could reach this higher bar. And she asked me to work with her on an idea for a charter school. Her name was Carol, Carol Kelly. Again, about a year, a year and a half later, Carol and I co-founded Harding Charter Preparatory High School. It is in the inner city of Oklahoma City in about 33rd and Chartel. If you're ever in the city, go by and take a look at it. It is one that is the majority of minority students high in poverty. 
Every year, the school graduates between 80 and about 90 to 95 students every year. And every year, every one of those students meet the bar. Every year, my favorite day is to go to graduation at Harding. I have nothing to do with the board of the school anymore, or the running of the school. It's just my biggest delight to see kids that normally should have been left behind, kids that otherwise would have fallen through the cracks, kids that walk in the door struggling to read and to do mathematics, some of them reading on a sixth grade level when they walk in the door. And to see those kids pass their high school exams with the worst percentile of passage in a certain subject area being at 90% of the cl class passes their high stakes test. Kids with an ACT average that's one point above the nations and two points above the states. The school traditionally handling, handing out between 4.5 and $5 million in scholarships to between the 80 to 95 kids that graduate from the school. Kids that are national merit finalists, national merit semifinalists, presidential scholars, kids that get full tuition to schools both in-state and out-of-state, kids that believe in themselves and believe in the dream that they have. Every year, the school graduates approximately four or five what we call independent livers. Those are kids that are homeless, some of them by choice because they come from such broken homes and broken families that living at home is intolerable. Kids that either live on somebody else's couch, moving from week to week, or live in independent living by youth services of Oklahoma County. These are kids that go to college and are taught by those teachers and that staff and that faculty and the supportive help of other parents that they too can achieve. Every year is a living witness that it is possible for every child to live their dreams. Every child can reach that bar that is set up for them. Every child has a future as a productive citizen of the state and a part of the future of this state and of this nation. Every year they graduate those kids, so you can see why. Every year I go back to graduation and I just grin the entire time I'm there. It is so exciting. So as you can see, education never got out of my blood. And after that, after opening Harding, I, be, I continued to work on education policy. Long story short, after a while, some individuals came to me and asked me to run for state superintendent. Our previous superintendent had been in office for 20 years. For 20 years. Never before had a Republican been elected to this position in the state. Two had been appointed, but never one elected to state superintendent. I was a novice to politics, never ran for anything in my life. Didn't know how to raise money, and it was considered to be kind of a joke that my Democratic opponent was a shoe-in, very powerful senator. Ladies and gentlemen, I simply outworked her. I simply outworked her. And I think I won by something, I can't even remember, I think it was something by, like 19 or 20 points at the end of the election. I did it because of folks like you. Because folks like you got out and worked and put out yard signs and talked to your neighbors and said, we can do better in Oklahoma. These children deserve more in Oklahoma. And for that, I'm grateful. I remember the fights in those days. I remember State Question 744. Does anybody remember State Question 744? When I got into the race, that thing was, had an approval rating of 65%. State Question 744 wanted to dictate funding for education, take the decision away from our state legislature, and continue to appropriate more education funding to reach something called a regional average without any form of accountability into how the money was being spent, without any form of direction for how the money would be applied. 
guess what? The liberal unions, the NEA poured $4 million into the project. But it's grassroots organizations like the 912 Project and ROPE. I remember some individuals from ROPE standing up next to me. Jenny's over there and some of her folks standing up and speaking in opposition of 744. And I was so proud to come out early opposed to that and came out hard. When it had a high approval rating, I still fought and came out against it. And I think the measure, because of your work, you got it over the top, your grinding work, your phone calls, talking to neighbors, it was defeated by over 80% because you helped Oklahomans understand the truth. And so you can see that I gained an early respect and an early admiration for that and for the, for the powers of this group. When I ran, I ran on a reform agenda. And I want to go over the results of that agenda before we get into talking about the Common Core to help you understand that I have never lost that philosophy. I have never left that philosophy. When I came into office, the state was meeting a $550 million budget deficit. The country was in the middle of a financial crisis, but thank the Lord the state runs on a balanced budget. You have no idea how important that is. We had $2.30 some odd cents in the rainy day fund. It was totally spent away. I walked in with a state board that had previously approved a budget request that was an increase of about $850 million at a time when our state was meeting a $550 million deficit. And a state board approved by a Democratic governor and one where the state board told me that they were going to do everything they could to oppose implementation of all of the reforms that we wanted to pass. Maybe some of you even remember my most memorable first state board meeting. I'll tell you what, I'll have that meeting all over again, 20 times over, because it energized the legislature and it energized Governor Fallon. And they then understood the nature of the fight ahead of them and it united them behind this. So let's talk about some of those reforms because ladies and gentlemen, they took my breath away. We talked about them during the campaign and when I got into office, meeting that deficit and having to produce a brand new budget in under two weeks, and with the legislative session starting in three weeks, I was hoping that perhaps 80% of those reforms could get passed in the first session. They passed every one of them. Every one of them. And I want you to thank your legislators for that when you see them. We, it's, there's so many things have been happening that you sometimes forget that, about the work and about the fight that they had to get those things passed, and we so much appreciate them. So let me kind of remind you of some of them. The first one is trial de novo, fancy term. But what that meant is, is that previous to that time, the decision of a local school board and whether or not to fire a teacher could be overturned. Because prior to this, a teacher could turn around to a district court judge and appeal their firing. And as we knew in Oklahoma City, that, was re that recently had happened prior to the passage of that bill. And a teacher had their firing overturned by a district court judge. State legislature removed that ability and the cancellation of trial de novo went forward. And the decision is now back in the hands of the local school board. Social promotion. This is one that will be implemented this year with this year's, this coming spring with this year's third graders. And it's based on a very simple premise. I don't know about you, but if a child is not reading on third grade level, that child should not be promoted to the fourth grade. And this is a bill, and this was a courageous, courageous vote. This is a bill that ended social promotion beyond the third grade. Everybody in this room knows that if you can't read, you can't do anything else. And we also know that a child learns to read from kindergarten through the third grade.
But then after the third grade, things change. And that's when you read to learn. And that if a child is not on grade level, they get further and further and further behind as they go through school. And we see an increase in behavior problems within our school, an incredible increase in referrals for special education for kids that don't need special education, that just need a different approach to their education. We see an increase in the dropout rate. For those kids that do make it to college, we saw a big increase in the number of kids that had to take remedial courses, spend money on their education and get no credit for it in order to take high school over again to get ready for college courses. And we knew from the state statistics was telling us that only half of those kids were actually graduating from college. Pretty discouraging. And so we looked at the results in other states and said, we're going to draw the line here at third grade. And if a student does not reading on grade level at the, the end of third grade, then they don't get promoted. But at the State Department, did we just leave that out and leave it alone and, and say, well, districts, you better get busy. We are there with education programs for teachers to help teachers learn, first of all, how to recognize particular problems in their students that are struggling as readers, and to give them alternate teaching techniques in order to reach those kids. How to individualize instruction how to take a look at the data they had from their interim assessments that they give and to know how to adjust their instruction for that particular child. We've been doing that for the last couple of years. We're doing it full force this year as well in meeting teachers. We had a wonderful turnout in our state conference. We had over 5,000 teachers there at their state conference. And a major focus of the conference was around reading and reading instruction for teachers of all grade bands. And so this spring, say a prayer for those teachers because they're working so, so hard. This spring, the first assessments will be made, and this will be a hard time because those kids that don't score, sat that don't, that are score less than satisfactory, that fail the test, will be retained. There are provisions for some kids to be able to move on with special help but it is largely one that ends social promotion. And that is one that we're very excited that is about to come back. I told you that I would be a champion of accountability and transparency in our districts. And the first step towards that was the A through F grade card. That was another tough vote. If I told you that the school your grandchild was going to or your child was going to got an API score of 1125, you'd say, well, okay. But if I told you that it was out of a total of 1500, you might nod and try to do some quick math computations in your head, but you wouldn't real, be really impressed by that one number. And if I said, well, your child's school earned a grade of C, C plus. You go, okay, now I understand. What, what gave them the C plus? Why isn't it an A? And then you would be able to dive down even deeper into the individual grades that were given for different achievement in different subject areas and how much a student, student population was able to grow over the period of the year. You'd look at things such as attendance, and in the high schools, how many of them took advanced placement courses or concurrent enrollment in our colleges and universities. You need a report about how those children are doing to understand the school. Last year was the first time a grade card came out, and it was unprecedented, the level of involvement of people across the state in interest in the grade card and interest in getting involved in the schools. And indeed, since really my first month in office, I have been visiting during the school term a minimum of one district a week, sometimes as many as three. And last year as I went around the state after issuance of the grade card, I had so many individuals and parents and, and community members saying, how do we become an A district? And so we developed what we called the Raise the Grade Tour. 
And we went out and listened to folks in towns and listened to educators and then continued to give them advice on how they can be a part of this. Because from my first week in office, I said, this effort is all hands on deck. We can't just leave it to the educators to move our state forward and to get it out of nearly the bottom in terms of achievement and how we're gonna help the state advance. And so I asked community folks, I asked chambers of commerce and rotaries and Kiwanis groups and church groups, I asked them to become involved in education and they have responded. I also appreciate the leadership of superintendents that called me on the phone and said, Superintendent Barisi, all right, our district got a D. And I told my staff I was done with that and we weren't gonna stand for that anymore. And one superintendent initiated weekly coffees with parents and weekly coffees with community people and organized weekly meetings with the principals and the staff and have the staff meet within their school to have specific agendas in each addressing how they were going to improve. That's ownership of the problem and that's leadership in taking care of the problem. And every single time I'll have the back of that educator that understands that this is a report and not a condemnation. And those children in those districts are for the better for that level of leadership. And I very much appreciate that. You deserve to know how your schools are functioning. You deserve to know how the money is being spent and applied to education efforts within your school. And that's why this year, as I issue my budget for the coming year, it will have with it measures of achievement that all of us will stand accountable for. So you can understand the impact of your tax dollars on education. You deserve it and we're gonna deliver it to you. As a matter of fact, uh, Budget Director Dorflinger tells me that they're gonna actually require of it of every state agency in the state. He liked my idea so much. He said, absolutely. We're doing that with every agency within the state. The taxpayers have a right to know how their dollar bills are being spent and the results we're getting for that. That's a very critical point. Accountability and transparency. Increasing parent education choice. When I came into office, we already had one form of education choice, the Lindsay Nicole Henry Bill. That allowed parents of, of special needs students that were enrolled in a school district the opportunity to take state dollars that were appropriated for their child's education and to enroll their child in a private school if they felt that was a better environment for their child. I absolutely supported that effort at the time it was passed prior to my coming into office, and it is one that I'm continuing to support and to work towards increasing the number of individuals and their information about that and those participating in it. But it's one in which a certain school district saw fit to sue the parents of special needs students simply because those parents wanted to use their right to make the appropriate choice for their child. I strongly disagree. And indeed, our state Supreme Court found that that district had no standing. That is an appropriate finding. We've worked to continue to improve the expansion of school choice for all parents. A zip code shouldn't determine the quality of your child's education. So we've had an expansion in the number of charter schools in the state, but I'm not nearly satisfied with that number. And we'll continue to support those groups that are seeking to institute quality charter schools. I don't know if you know it, but we've had a charter school in Oklahoma City that was recently closed by the Oklahoma City School Board for poor performance. I talked to the superintendent about it relentlessly ever since the day I came into office and finally convinced them that the school needed to be closed down. They were closed down because of the lack of academic performance and also for the very poor and inappropriate way that they spent tax dollars. And so if a school is not educating their children appropriately and not 
correctly using their state dollars, they should be shut down. And that should apply to all schools, not just charter schools, but to all schools. But I'll continue to support the expansion of charter schools and all forms of education choice in the state, including vouchers. I've said that consistently, and I continue to support it, and I will continue to support it. Achieving classroom excellence, ACE. That's legislation that provides, that, that has the audacity to say that a student should show mastery of subject level before graduating from high school. What a revolutionary idea. It is being fought against every single year. I think it's in its 10th year since the legislation passed. And last year was the first year that high school students were held accountable for it. And you had howls from the education establishment across the state. How can you do this to high school students, denying them their diplomas easily? I was being told I was embarrassing students. I said I'd rather embarrass them now than have them be embarrassed in front of their families when they can't get a job. And so we held strong on that. And the legislature held strong on it. And last year, our kids were held accountable for it. We were told there were going to be thousands of appeals and thousands more students were going to fail and not be successful. We had alternate means for them to be successful. And in the end, we had a 97% pass rate of the requirements in the state. And in the end, last year, we had 143 kids appeal. That's it. Do you know how many we've had this year? Four. Four. Kind of like that deal. Can I interrupt you? Sure. Um, I know you're limited on time, but we would like to hear where you stand on Common sure. Core. So sure. Would, I'm just getting to that. that. You I bet. That I'm just much. getting to that. Thank, Thank you. you very I much. It. I'm telling you about all of these reforms because I wanted to establish for you the fact that I'm a strong conservative, I believe in accountability and I believe in transparency. And so what I want to talk to you about today, as you've came here to listen, is talk about the Common Core. And to talk about the implementation of higher standards. I promised you higher standards when I ran for this office. I'm continuing to call for higher standards as I go into my re-election cycle. And so I want to talk to you about the Common Core. As you know, back in 2009, educators from across the country came together under the organization of the Council of Chief State School Officers. That's a professional organization that represents what we call gen ourselves generically as state chiefs. They represent us in combination with the National Governors Association. And educators came together at the behest of business and community people and said, we need a set of higher standards for all kids across the country. They were concerned. If you remember during the Reagan administration, a nation at risk identified the greatest single threat to our country is problems with our education. And so educators, three of them were from the state of Oklahoma, wrote standards in English and in mathematics, and develop guidelines for something called literacy across subject matter. That means ideas about how you're going to write about things and things that you want to read about across subject matter. And I'm going to give you some specific examples here in just a second. It's met with some opposition, but it was born out of the idea that a child living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in reading and in mathematics, should be, reading, should be learning at the same sequence that a child in Washington State is, or Minneapolis, or Chicago, or San Diego, or Charlottesville, Virginia. 
They should be learning at the same sequence as everyone else because this is a transient country. This is a transient state. And our poorest children move on the average of every six months and change school districts in this state. That's pretty tough for a child to try to catch up after that period of time. They wanted higher standards. They, and, and especially the military asked for this because as their military dependents were moving around the country, they were expressing concern and dismay for the different uh, things that their kids were being taught. So they'd move into a district getting ready to learn something from their old district and it had already been taught in that district. And so, or it was taught in the lower grade or the upper grade and they expressed dismay behind that. So the U.S. Department of Defense has already joined in support of this effort. And so our state legislature took this up in 2010 and approved the adoption of the Common Core for reading and mathematics. That was after a period of public comment at which we received robust public comment both on the state level and on the national level, and a time of ability for everyone to come together and make comment about the standards. And then districts were directed to implement them. And so when I came into office then, the law had been passed with the directions towards implementation. And we went about the work of doing that. So when I came into office, I knew there was concern around the Common Core standards. And so I took a look at them. I looked at them in great detail. And I said, these are pretty good, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of them. I said, these are very good. They're raising the standards. But then I looked at developing standards in science and social studies. Social studies just simply wrote a framework of standards, and I looked at them and I said, this didn't meet Oklahoma standards. It doesn't meet what Oklahomans want. It was full of a lot of pop, pop culture and uh, not much emphasis on appropriate history, kind of like different versions of history. And I said, this isn't going to work. So I assembled a committee of 60 individuals, educators from across all the grade bands, higher education officials, experts in history and social studies and geography and all of the areas of social studies, and they completely rewrote the Oklahoma Social Studies Standards. Those went out to review by public comment and public hearing and were approved by the state board and subsequently then went through the legislature for their review and approval as well. This year was the first year that they were, this past year they were taught in our schools and we had a field test at the end of the year and then the operational test will take place next year. We're doing the same thing with science. We revised the science standards when I came into office, but external reviews said they were still substandard. So I said, let's wipe the slate clean and completely rewrite science. And so we are rewriting science content and then also process standards. That means how you're going to, standards for uh, what needs to be learned per grade level uh, for the laboratory and for field work. And then they have to be aligned with mathematics as well, as you know, in science. So it takes a little bit longer. They are going to more than likely be released, released to educators for their review next month. And then they will go out for public comment we hope by the end of September or early October. I will let Rhonda know and other organizations know when they come out so you can be notified. We'll do everything we can to give public notice because folks, we want you to review them and we want your comment. You will have an opportunity to go online and review them and to write your comment and then you will be able to see the changes we make or the comments we make back in relationship to your comments. Let me ask you to do one thing. When you review them and you comment, please be very specific. Please refer to the particular standard number that you have a concern about and be specific about what you believe is incorrect, not right, poor focus, and all of that. 
please review them. We've got to have your comments. Minimum of 30 days, they'll be out for public comment, and then we will have public hearings. If we need more time, we'll take more time. Then we'll have public hearings. They will go before the state board and then go to the state legislature. And then after that, we'll do the same process that we did with social studies in that. We just got through reviewing the, um, the visual and performing arts standards, and those were just approved by the state board as well. And so, as you can see, we're doing a lot in the area of standards. And so we called all of them collectively, instead of calling them three or four different things, we call them the Oklahoma Academic Standards. Now, what is a standard? A standard is a statement about what every child should know and be able to do per subject, per grade level. It's a statement about what a child should know and be able to do per subject and per grade level. A curriculum is the material, the methodology that a teacher chooses at the school site and sometimes even at the classroom site on how to teach that standard. So to give you an analogy, let's all say we're going to go to a meeting that's in Dallas, Texas. We know an address in Dallas, Texas, and we know exactly where that place is. But the route each of us may take is going to be different. Some of us are going to take the interstate on down. Some of us have to take a toll road in order to get onto the interstate. Other people may come from rural areas and first travel down a dirt or gravel road to get to a state highway to be able to get to Dallas. But no matter what route we take, we're going to end up in Dallas. Dallas is the standard. That's the equivalent of what we're calling a standard. The curriculum is the route you take, the road you take to get to Dallas. That is the difference. And that is a very important difference. Because the decision on how to teach a standard is made in the classroom. And please hear me on this is that the decision on the way it will be taught is made at the local school district. It has always been so, and it will ever be thus. As state superintendent, I do not tell teachers how to teach a standard. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a liberal teacher teaching something, teaching a standard, they will teach in the way they determine it should be taught, unless they're instructed differently by their local school board. And that's why I'm telling you, this fight is at the local school boards. And one of the most important services you can do to your state is to run for your school board and to participate in this and making those decisions. And I'm asking each of you to prayerfully consider that of running for your school board because that's where this fight is. Indeed, as a parent with my kids in high school, they went to a high school where they had a very liberal uh, history teacher, U.S. government teacher, very, very liberal. And he taught them that Ronald Reagan was a criminal because of the Iran-Contra affair and should have been impeached on these different reasons. And he put it on an exam, and the only right answer was to answer the way the, the teacher wanted them to. And my boys, being kids that or the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, they stood their ground, and they got a very bad grade on the test. As a mom, I respectfully went to the teacher and objected, pointing out that this was a matter of opinion and not true uh, history, and he disagreed. Went to the principal. The principal did nothing. Went to the superintendent. Oh, I'll look into it. Nothing happened. Went to my local board member who told me their hands were tied. Their hands aren't tied. They have control of the situation. So, no matter what standards we have, if you have a liberal teacher wanting to teach them a certain way, that will happen unless their school board intervenes. Now, let me, let me give you an example about exactly how this looks. And I pulled some of these um, right out of our state, out of the, uh, uh, the standards that we are showing for reading and for, mathematics, for English and mathematics. 
So I pulled one from the sixth grade, and this is reading informational standard for grade six. And it says, determine the central idea of a text. It doesn't say fiction, it doesn't say nonfiction, it just says a text. And how it conveys, how that central idea is conveyed, and give particular details on how that is conveyed. And then provide a summary of that text that is distinct from your personal opinion and your personal judgment. Because that's the way a lot of our kids up until now have been taught to write. Give me your opinion of this. Tell me about your summer vacation. Well, that's nice to have that kind of writing. But that's not the kind of writing that's going to get them ahead in the world. They have to do close reading of something and be able to draw conclusions because that's what the core does. Janet, it is content... Janet. Sure. Um, can you give about a minute to wrap up? And uh, then, because we want to leave some time for Q&A, and I sure. know you've got to leave early. So if you could sort of sure. wrap things up, and then we'll bring people up for questions. So that gives you an idea that the Common Core provides the chance to think critically and to pro solve problems. And that's a big distinction from our standards. So that teacher could teach that standard by going into social studies, and instead of talking about the problems they had during the Revolutionary War, actually present certain letters written by George Washington, and the students would read those letters and draw conclusions about the main reason for those that he wrote those letters, but give evidence of that in their writing, and not give their opinion of it, but summarize it using evidence. And that gives you an idea. I have another example of mathematics in the third grade, where third graders are supposed to expand their skills in addition and multiplication, but then learn to apply it by finding the area of a rectangle. And so one, one teacher may decide that kids are going to decide how many tile they've got to buy in order to tile a certain rectangular area. So they have to find the area and decide how many tile they're going to buy. Another teacher may do it in a completely different way. But each of those teachers individually decide how they're going to teach that standard. So. Right. That's good. Can you hear me? 